In the beginning of this course, we started looking at rational decision making and how to maximize expected utility. And we did that for about 10 lectures. And at the end of those 10 lectures, we said there are a lot of probabilities that show up in these computations. And so far, at that time, we had assumed that those probabilities were provided to us. Then in the next third of this course, which has just about finished up, we looked at how we can compute probabilities when there are large numbers of random variables in play. Today, we're going to tie that back to decision, to decision making. So we're going to look at base nets in the context of decision making. And we're going to look at a new concept, which is, which is called the value of perfect information. The idea there is that maybe you're willing to pay to get a certain amount, a certain piece of information. And can we compute how much you would be willing to pay to get certain information? OK, so decision networks. What do they look like? Here's an example. We have different types of nodes. We still have basenet type nodes. They're sitting over here. We have two random variables here. We still put them in circular nodes. The first one is weather. It could be sunny or rainy. The second one is the forecast. It could be a sunny forecast or a rainy forecast. And we have some arrow between the two because we think that you know, what the real weather will be like will influence what the forecast is going to be. Then we have a new type of variable sitting in the graph. It's one sitting in a rectangle. Those are action variables. So these are not random. These are ones that your agent gets to pick. In this case, you get to pick between bringing an umbrella or not bringing an umbrella. And the last type of node here is a utility node. And that utility node encodes how much utility you get for a certain outcome. These are the same kind of utilities that we have seen at the bottom of expected max trees. For every possible outcome, there will be some number. Here we're depicting some different types of outcomes. The first outcome here is it's sunny, and you decided not to bring your umbrella, so you get to play with the beach ball. Another outcome, it's still sunny, but now you didn't anticipate it. You brought your umbrella, and your buddies are playing with the beach ball, and you're dragging around your umbrella. Not as happy. Lower utility value. Another outcome shown here, it's raining, and you did not bring an umbrella. That's the worst of all worlds. And then here it's raining, and you brought an umbrella, so it's something medium. When I'm drawing these outcomes here for the utility node, what I'm really looking at is the parents of the utility node. These are the two parent variables. And I look at all combinations of values they can take on. I catalog them, and there will be a number for each of the possible joint instantiations of the parents of the utility node. OK, so what we try to do is maximize our expected utility. That means choosing the action that maximizes the expected utility, potentially given some evidence. We're going to operationalize, operationalize this in decision networks, which are a lot like business, but with additional variables, action variables, and utility nodes. The base net variables are the chance nodes. Actions are sitting in rectangles. And utility nodes are sitting in diamonds. OK, so how does this work? You're supposed to pick an action. That's your task. How you pick the action? Well, you instantiate all the evidence, whatever you get to observe. If you get to see the forecast, then you observe that variable. Then what you do is you set your action variable to each possible value. You calculate the posterior for the parent variables of the utility node. And then you compute the expected utility by computing a weighted sum according to the probability of each of the outcomes. And the utility is based on your particular action value. After you've done that for all actions, you then pick the action that maximizes the expected utility. Let's look at an example. So a very simple example here. 
we have one utility node, which will typically be the case, one action node, and one chance node. We have some numbers, a distribution for the weather variable. We have a utility table associating numbers with each possible outcome of the parent variables of the utility node. As you can see here, 100 is the highest. That's when you leave the umbrella at home and it's sunny. Zero is the lowest. That's when it's raining and you left your umbrella at home. The other two are in between. Let's say you were to leave your umbrella at home. Then you say, well, what is now my expected utility? Well, we can compute that. Your expected utility would be expected utility for leave is equal to, well, you could either have sunny or rainy. So it's probability for sun times the utility for sun and leave plus the probability for rain times the utility of rain and leave. So looking at the tables, that would be equal to 0 0.7 times 100 plus 0 0.3 times 0, which gives us 70. So that is your expected value under this particular model for leaving your umbrella at home. You could also have umbrella equal bring it, then, or it's called take, we'll match that notation, take, then we have the expected value for take is equal to, well, same type of equation. probability of sun times the utility for sun and take plus probability for rain times the utility of rain and take which is equal to 0 0.7 times sun and take is over here 20 plus 0 0.3 times rain and take is 70 Putting this together, we get 14 plus 21, which is 35. Then you compare both numbers. 70 is the higher number. So that means that the expected utility for leave is the highest one of the two. Those are your two options. So you would go with leave umbrella at home under this particular model over here. And we'd have that the maximum expected utility for this scenario is equal to 70, and it's achieved by the action leave. Sometimes we'll write this more explicitly as MEU for the empty set. That phi inside the braces denotes that we have no information. No evidence has been observed. All right, any questions about this computation? This is what we'll be doing, but we'll make it more complicated as we go along. Okay? Now, you can look at this as an expected max tree. It really is an expected max tree that you're solving here. This is what it looks like. So carefully look at what we're looking at here. We have a maximizer node. Gets to choose between two actions, take or leave. After you commit it to your action, you go outside with or without your umbrella, and then the chance node kicks in, and you'll have rain or sun. And so what we have here is exactly what we've done for expected max. We've just drawn the expected max representation in a different way by drawing it out this way here. This here specifies the same problem as the problem on the right. Spelled out on the right, we're spelling out a way of solving the problem. On the left here, this is really just a specific this is really just a specification. Whereas on the right, we see how the computation would play out. 
still have to run a search, but that tree exposes how that search would work. So what's different between what we have done before and what, what we're doing now? Yes? Say that again? Sorry. So what's different is that we're now going to account for evidence. And for now, we don't have any evidence, but we're already being very explicit about the fact that we could, in principle, account for it. And so if you look at the chance node here, we annotate the chance node with the name of a random variable, and we annotate it also with the evidence that will be available at the time that that chance node kicks in. In this particular case, we have no evidence, so we have an empty set that's being propagated down. But if there were some evidence, let's say the forecast, then that would be sitting in that set. And you, you would have the information about what the forecast would be, or maybe it would be a split, depending on if you don't know the forecast yet, maybe you'd know it later, and there'd be a split on what it end up being. So for now, that's the only difference that you see here is that we have this conditioning over here, and we're very explicit about the information that's available to us at any given time. OK, so let's include the forecast and see how it plays out. So we have two actions again, leave and take. And what we already did on the slide here is a little bit of computation. So what you see here is the posterior for weather given the forecast equals bad. So we observed the bad forecast, and we computed the posterior for weather given forecast equal bad. That is not something we're given to us. That is something you can compute from the base net here. What you're given is the prior for W and the conditional for forecast given W. And from that, you can compute this thing over here. So that would be the first step in your computation always. You would go ahead and compute the posterior for all the parent variables of your utility node, given the evidence you have. We're not going to show again how this is done. For this very simple case, you could just apply Bayes' rule, because it's just two variables connected to each other. In general, you run variable elimination or sampling in your base net and get a posterior distribution for the parent variables given the evidence, variable, evidence variables. Once you've done that, you're back to the same kind of computation. You say, OK, umbrella equals leave. What do I have to do now? The expected utility. Yeah. This pointer is not very happy today. The expected utility for this over here is equal to, well, it could be sunny or rainy, so the probability of sun. But now given forecast equals bad times the utility of sun and leave plus the probability of rain given the forecast is bad, times the utility of rain and leave. Computing this, we have 0 0.34 times 100 plus 0 0.66 times 0, which is 34. We can do the same thing for the other action, expected utility of Umbrella, day, umbrella equals take is probability of sun given forecast is bad times the utility of sun and take plus the probability of rain given forecast is bad times the utility of rain comma take, which is equal to 0 0.34 times First one is sun and take, which gives us 20. Second one is rain and take, which gives us 70. Together, this gives us, let's see, 6.8 plus a complicated number. Um, maybe. 46 point something, 46.2. Let's see if we get that right, which would be 
3. So that's how we computed, except for that the arithmetic here might have been shaky. Um, let's see what it really is. OK, we had it right, 53. So the optimal, optimal decision here is to go with take, because 53 is higher than 34. And so we have, in this case, the maximum expected utility for the situation where our evidence is forecast equals bad is equal to 53. And it's achieved by take. So what we see here is by seeing the evidence, we ended up changing our action. We also ended up having a different expected utility. And that's typically what's going to happen, is that new evidence will change your expected utility and often also change your action. All right, so. Let's look at this one as an expected max tree. Again, the full specification is over here, assuming you have the tables for each of the nodes. And this is exposing the computation that's really happening when we're going over all these actions and checking what the best one is. This is the tree. What does it look like? Our evidence set is now bad forecast over here. We still get to choose an action. We're maximizing. We get to choose between, between take and leave. The chance node now is still over the variable weather, but conditioned on knowing that the forecast has said bad weather. Then it could still become sunny or rainy. Same thing over here. And there are utilities at the very bottom of this tree. So again, just expect the max, but annotated in a more detailed way about what evidence we have available and what evidence we will use to compute the chance nodes probabilities here. We know that we'll use P, W, given B over here to compute the split between rain and sun. OK, let's go back to Ghostbusters. Um, let's pull it up as a reminder. So what was this game again? We have a, we have a ghost. We don't know where it is. It could be in any of those 100 squares, or any of these 50 squares, each of them with 2% probability. We can sense, or we can bust. If we bust, we get a high reward if we bust in the right spot. If we bust in the wrong spot, well, then we lose. If we sense, then we'll get more information about where the ghost might be. Now remember, the way it worked is, well, say we sense over here. We get a measurement that could be any of a few different colors. It could be green, yellow, orange, or red. And the closer to red the color is, the more likely it is that the ghost is nearby. And we had a very precise model for this. It was a sensor model that said, for a given distance of the ghost from where you measure, there is a distribution over outcomes and all assigned probabilities to green, yellow, orange, and red according to the distance to the ghost. So in this case, we had orange. The ghost could be anywhere, but if we do a probabilistic update based on our sensory model, it's now likely that the ghost is somewhere nearby here where we see the 0.08. Maybe we sense over here next, 0.84. That was a lucky one. Um, we could decide to bust. We could decide to keep sensing. Um, maybe I want to sense another time over here, another time over here. Oops, probability went down all of a sudden. Over here, over here, keep sensing. I have a feeling I've got it really narrowed down. Let's go there and bust. Yes, we got the ghost. Nice, so we won the game. But the question you might ask yourself that we're going to look at in a later part of the lecture is, was it really necessary to sense, in this case, 10 times, or 11 times even, before busting the ghost? And how do you make that decision? How do you decide whether you've been sensing enough versus it's now time to bust? 
And you can imagine that if there's a cost for taking the time to sense, let's say you pay a cost of one to sense, and you get a reward of maybe, you know, 100 to bust, but there's maybe some discounting, so you want to get the reward sooner rather than later, that you could formalize this as an expected max problem where you could automatically compute whether right now the right thing to do is to sense one more time than well to bust already. Okay. So what does a decision network look like for Ghostbusters? Okay, let's take a look. We have a utility node that relates to the ghost location and your action. If your action is busting and you do it in the right spot, you get a high utility. In the wrong spot, you get a low utility. Then over here what we have is for each of the possible sensor locations where we could put our sensor, there is a random variable. That random variable depends on the ghost location. And so what we have is a base net with a very small number of arrows. Just there is one random variable ghost location that is the parent of all the other variables. So it's one in which you could actually do variable elimination very efficiently. It's a very efficient one to run inference in. And you can compute quite effectively the posterior for the ghost location given your sensory measurements. And when you saw these numbers updating over time, that's what you were seeing. You, were, you saw inference in this base net over here. And it would compute based on the current observations what the distribution is over ghost locations. Any questions about that? OK. Then now let's take a look. Now we know how this all works. We know how we can run inference and then find the maximum expected utility action. Let's see what value we can attribute with the sensing actions. So you can imagine that there's this magic potion that is information, and some information is worth a lot, some information is worth a little less, and some information is really not worth a whole lot. So the idea here is that we're going to compute the value of acquiring evidence, and we can do this directly from looking at the decision network. Let's do a very simple example first. The example here is, where do you want to buy oil drilling rights in a certain location? You're going to pick a location. Um, but there are so many locations to pick from. So maybe you want to pick the location where it's more likely there would be oil. And then you bought the rights there. You have a higher chance of actually finding something valuable. So here's the problem. We have, an, we have a random variable modeling where the oil is. We have an action variable picking the drilling location. And the utility then depends on those two variables. So let's say there are just two blocks, A and B. Only one of them has oil, and it's worth K. You can drill in just one location. The prior probabilities are 50-50 between the two locations. So this is the model. The location where the oil is, one half of the time at A, one half of the, of the time at B. If your drilling location matches up with your oil location, you get K. That's happening over here. If it doesn't match up, you get zero. All right. So the expected utility in this case for drilling in either A or B is the same, because you have no information. They're really symmetric to you. And the expected utility in both cases is K over 2, because half the time you'll be lucky, half the time you'll get zero. OK, so what is the value of information of knowing the location of the oil? How much would you be willing to pay if somebody told you what this variable here is? Rather than, so having a, making this one here into an evidence variable, how much would you be willing to pay in this scenario? K minus 1. Well, one option is K minus 1. That could or could not be the right thing. Any other options? So k over 2 is another suggestion. Why k over 2? k over 2, what would happen is if you pay k over 2, and then you know where the oil is, you paid k over 2, but then you go drill, and you're guaranteed to get the oil, and so your net gain is still k over 2, which is equivalent to what you had ahead of time. Right? Our currency here is all utilities. Right? This is, 
Remember, dollars and utilities are not the same. It's complicated. You can't just average dollars when you're working with utilities. But these are all utility units. And so we can directly compare expected utility k over 2 with expected utility k over 2. It doesn't matter how we achieve it, guaranteed k over 2, or half the time k, half the time k over 2, because these are utilities. So k over 2 is what you're willing to pay. Good. Ideally, you'd pay a little less, but that would be the maximum you'd be willing to pay in this particular scenario. That could happen to be k minus 1. You can solve this equation for k if you want a situation where your answer is also correct. Um, value is expected. The value of information is the expected gain in maximum expected utility from the new info. Now, what is the gain in maximum expected utility from knowing the oil location? That's what we just computed, k over 2. So that is what we call the value of perfect information. You perfectly get to know that random variable, no uncertainty left, and you can, in this case, quite easily compute that that's going to be k over 2. Just to put it explicitly on the slide, the comp computation you make is maximum expected utility for zero evidence, which would be some computation in this case, essentially would come out as, you know, you look at your two actions A and B, they both give you k over 2, so they're equal, and you'd have k over 2. The maximum expected utility for um, oil location equals A, which is k. The maximum expected utility for oil location equals B, which is also k. Then you would say, OK, what is my expected outcome if I get to observe the oil location? The expected outcome would be half the time it'll end up being A, half the time B. So we'd have 1 half MEU A plus 1 half MEU B. And we'd compare that with MEU for phi. That difference here tells us what we are willing to pay. Let me actually write it out up here. 1 half MEU A plus 1 half MEU B minus MEU phi. More generally, this 1 half would be PA, and this 1 half would be PB. Why are we weighting these here, these maximum expected utilities, when you get to observe something? Because at the time you tell somebody, I want to observe this, you don't know yet what the outcome is going to be. So you have to compute an expectation and say, on the average, what am I going to get from getting to observe this particular variable? And then in this case, we just average them with 1 half, 1 half, each of the values we would get. That difference in this case ends up being k over 2 plus k over 2 minus k over 2 which is equal to k over 2. A lot of k over 2s in this particular computation doesn't have to play out that way. Yes? OK, when you know it's A, we assume here observing O equals A, O equals B, right? That's our observation. The maximum expected utility for the observation O equal A, you have to do two computations then. You have to say, when I observe that, how much would I get if I take action drill at A? How much do I get if I take action drill at B? As we have done before. See which one is the best one. The best one is the one that achieves the MEU. And so we just pick that one. Because the action is a choice, we can pick the maximum. All right. So the fair price for this information is k over 2. If you knew how to acquire that information, you could build a business and charge people k over 2. All right. Now, let's do this for the weather example. We have the forecast here. You can ask yourself the question, what is the value of perfect information of the forecast? How are we going to compute that? Well, what do we need to look at? How much are we willing to pay to get to observe the forecast? Well, when you get to observe the forecast, there's a probability that the forecast 
equals sun. There's a probability that the forecast equals rain. Then if the forecast were sun, you would have some maximum expected utility for that particular forecast. And if it were rain, you'd have a maximum expected utility for the case that the forecast were rain. You sum these together, then you subtract out the maximum expected utility when you have no forecast, so the empty evidence set, and that will give you the value of perfect information of the weather variable, not weather, um, forecast. All right, let's compute this. What is the maximum expected utility in the case of forecast equals sun? I think that's the one we didn't do yet. Let's see, what, what have we found so far? We have found the case for forecast equals bad. That was 53. We could, in this computation here, we could have done the same type of computation for forecast equals good, in which case these numbers here would have changed, and as a consequence, these numbers would have changed. And which would have given us, actually this is called good, this is called good, bad. We did this computation over here, and we found this was 53. This one we haven't done, but we could do it the same way. Um, I'm going to look it up for you, what it gives us. That one gives us 95 if we work through the math. Then this one here, when we have no information, we've done that one before. That one is sitting in the very beginning. It wasn't even an evidence variable there. We had an expected utility for the best action, which was leave of 70. So we have 70 over here. Now these have to be weighted. Forecast being good and bad have some probabilities. And how would you find those probabilities? You actually run inference in the base net. Because that's not given to you. You have probability for weather, probability for forecast given weather. And from that, you'd run inference, and you'd find a distribution for the forecast. So computing these values of perfect information takes some work. But we now know what that work is. Let's take a look at what the result would be. If we work through all of this, the 70 we've done before, the 53 we've done before, the 95 is the same type of computation as the 53. Then the distribution for forecast was computed in that base net to be 0.59 and 0.41 for good and bad. You compute, this is P good times maximum expected utility for forecast equals good plus P bad times maximum expected utility of forecast equals bad minus maximum expected utility of no evidence at all. We do that computation, we get 7.8. So that means that in terms of utility units, we would be willing to give, enough, give up 7.8 utility units ahead of time to get to find out the forecast as that would be equivalent to not knowing the forecast at all. Anything less than 7.8, we pay to find out the forecast. We can increase our expected utility. Yes? The way we get that is because we have the distribution for weather, the distribution for forecast given weather, and based on these two we run, we could say, well, then we run inference. For this particular case, it's just a very simple base net. You could compute the joint of F and W as the product of the margin for W with 
the conditional of f given w, and then you could sum out over f over w to get the distribution for forecast. So that, that's a very important question, actually, is that in general, and that's why this is coming back now, this type of decision making, is that in general, to find these probabilities, you have to run inference in your base net. And it can require a lot of work. Typically, we wouldn't ask you to solve something like this for a huge base net, because you'd want to write a piece of code that runs the inference for you. And so on the slides, we do simple examples. But in general, you'd have a huge base net. You run inference in it. And find the probability distribution for the parents of the utility node. Okay, this is the general equation. Let's parse this equation. What is this saying? It's saying that the value of perfect information, meaning getting to observe the random variable E prime, given you already have some evidence, is the sum over all possible outcomes for that random variable E prime of the probability of that outcome, given the evidence you already have, times the maximum expected utility for all your evidence combined. That's this part over here. In our example, the evidence set started empty. So it's as if, in our example, it's as if this thing didn't exist. That's how our example was set up, without having any prior evidence. But as we know from all these probability computations, any of these probability calculus exercises, you can always just add in something additional behind the conditioning bar, and you'll end up with a similar type of expression that still holds true. So that's what's happening over here. Any questions about this equation here, which defines our value of perfect information for a random variable E prime? Okay, so the question is about some, sometimes a qualitative assessment of how will this all play out, right? Will this typically come out positive, negative? Can it be that I add a variable and then it's very high? Another one, it's very low and so forth? We'll get to that in just a couple of slides. Let's look at this again in terms of decision trees and so forth. So we have a maximum expected utility quantity for a given evidence set. So some evidence has been observed, which means you maximize over all actions the probability of the state of the world, and really what matters is the parent variables of your utility node, given that evidence, summed together, multiplied with the utility of that particular state being the real state of the world, and you then taking that action A. So this is just our standard expected max equation, with being explicit about evidence having been observed that affects the probabilities in the chance nodes. Assume we see that the evidence variable E prime equals small e prime. What is the value if we act then? Well, we write it out this way. It's the same equation, just we now have an E prime everywhere where there, before there was just an E. Now, E prime, in the setup we're considering, could be a random variable whose value we, whose value we don't know yet. How do we write it then? If we don't know the value yet, we can't write it this way. It's not a max over actions and then a sum over all possible outcomes with these probabilities. So what we have to do is we have to treat E prime as a random variable. And we're now going to sum over all possible outcomes of E prime in our calculation. So our maximum expected utility, when E is known, but E prime is not known, we sum over all possible outcomes of E prime. After we observe E prime, we get to choose an action. And so we get a maximum expected utility. That's this expression over here. But we have to weight them by the probability of getting to observe a particular E prime. The difference between those two is the value that we get out of knowing E prime. 
So the difference, sorry, the difference between this one here, this one here, is the value we get out of knowing E prime. So value of perfect information, difference between this one here and this one here. Let's look at this in terms of expect the max trees. The first scenario is one where we have some evidence, E. Let's say for concreteness, it's equal to plus E. We assume there's some evidence. Could it just as well have been minus E, but just to draw something concrete, we assume plus E. That's what the first maximizer node is annotated with. Then maximizer gets to choose an action. After taking the action, the chance node kicks in and will instantiate the state of the world according to the distribution given right here, S given plus E. This one here, that uses the same distribution as given plus E. It's just that it's after you've taken a different action, and so the utilities will typically be different down there because your action was different. Now, if you knew additional evidence, E prime, all that happened is everywhere where there was E, you now also have E prime in there. So you now have plus E comma plus E prime. If you are going to get to observe E prime, but you haven't observed it yet, this is what it looks like. You start with just evidence E plus E. Then you have a transition that's stochastic. And the probability of getting plus E prime, negative E prime, is what's sitting on this chance node over here. Negative E prime on this side, plus E prime on that side. And they're weighted by the distribution that you can compute from your base net. So you look in your base net, you'll compute a posterior distribution for E prime given plus E and use that to put that in your chance node. After that, you get to choose an action. The action, just like we had in any expected max, the action you choose in this subtree does not have to be the same as the action you choose over here. Because you know in which subtree you land after you see E prime, and then just based on that, you'll take some action. To choose that action here, you do a expected max over here, over here, you find the best action, and that's what you would pick over there. Yes? So S, S is the state of the world, or if you want to do it more compactly, S is all the variables that are the parents of the utility node. Because only the parents of the utility node will affect the utility at the bottom of the tree. So that's S. It's a vector va valued variable that could be many random variables in one variable then revealed means that in this model over here, we assume that initially you already know the evidence for E. It's plus E. After that, somebody will reveal to you the value of E prime. And you don't know yet what that's going to be, so that's why there's a chance node at the top. And that chance node, the probabilities in there are according to the distribution for E prime given E equals plus E. And then after that has been revealed to you, you get to choose an action. And then you hit the chance node where the state S will crystallize stochastically. And then you hit the utility nodes. When a node gets revealed, when a variable gets revealed to you, that means that you actually get to measure it. You get to see the value. So what's the, probability? the probabilities are up to you to run inference for. Nobody's going to reveal those to you. You're going to have to run inference in your base net to find them. But the values of the variables, somebody has to reveal to you, or you have to use your sensor to get them. Yes? After evidence gets revealed, if you hit a chance node, you will use that evidence to then compute the posterior distribution for what the state of the world is based on that evidence. And that will determine the chance node's probabilities. So for each of these chance nodes, to know what the probabilities are on those chance nodes, you have to run inference in your base net based on the evidence you have seen so far. Another one, yes?
Absolutely. You could have actions, and the action is just, my action is that I'm going to measure a particular variable. That's absolutely possible. That's really what's happening in the Ghostbusters game. You choose between the busting action or the sensing action. And then there are many possible sensing actions because you have 50 possible locations you could be sensing at. And that's really what we're trying to formalize here. With the concept we have here, this formalism allows us to have a search algorithm run over this type of expected max tree and tell us whether sensing is better than well acting in some way that changes the world is better. We're able to encode that in here. In this particular case, how would that play out? What we're looking at here is, let's compare this one here with this one here. So we have two scenarios. What's the value that we compute at the top of this expected max tree? The value we get there is the maximum expected utility for the evidence set plus E. OK? What we have over here is the maximum expected utility for plus E, and we'll get to observe E prime. We don't know E prime yet, but we will get to observe it be before we need to choose an action. Now, the difference between those two is the value of perfect information of the random variable E prime. So this one will always be higher. Why is the second one always going to be higher? Well, think about it. Let's say you get to act in this scenario over here. You solve this expected max tree. You'll get some value at the top. What you got to do here is you got to choose an action here and here. So there are two places you get to choose an action. You will know in which scenario you are. You will have observed plus E prime or negative E prime. And based on that, you can choose an action. If you that compare that with this scenario over here, here you take an action without ever having gotten to know what, whether it's going to be plus E prime or negative E prime. So you take an action with less information. I can make this one here. I can make the utility of this scenario here equal to the utility of the one on the top there. The way I can make it equal is by saying you are forced to, in both cases, choose left or in both cases, choose right. Like if you're forcing this maximizer here to take the ch same choice here and here, then you're decreasing their options. The expected max value will go down because you now have less options available to you, right? Originally, you could choose left, 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 right, right, left, and right, right. And by forcing them to be equal, you only get to choose between left, left, and right, right. Obviously, the optimum between just two options is going to be worse than the optimum amongst all four options. And the optimum between two options is exactly what you have over here. Because over here, you only get to choose left, left, or right, right, in the sense that whatever E prime comes out as, you'll always have to go with the same action. So what we just talked about here is the property that the value of perfect information, actually it's already written here, this quantity here will always be bigger than or equal to zero. Because if you get more information, you get to defer your choices. And that's equivalent to saying, let's say I had less information and I were in the same expected max tree here. That would mean you have to take the same action in different nodes, which is a restriction on your set of choices, and hence you get a lower best possible outcome. Any questions about that? Yes? It could sometimes be equal to zero. It could be the case that the information you get is just useless. Like, let's say somebody tells you, I don't know, 
something that you just doesn't affect your decision, right? Let's say you play a lottery. If somebody told you something like, oh, I know the weight of this ball is higher than the weight of all the other balls in the lottery, then that'll tell you something and gives you information that's strictly positive in value. But if they said last year when they ran lotteries, they used to use this rigged set of lottery balls, then you'll be like, well, they changed it since, so that value of information could be zero to you. If it's misleading, so the question is, can this ever be negative, right? Who thinks this can ever be negative? Who essentially thinks that what I just wrote on the slide was broken, I guess? <laughs> so why can this never be negative? It's very interesting, because you could think this could be negative, right? Think about the weather thing, All right? In the weather scenario, we had... Let's erase everything from this slide here. In the weather scenario, we had, if you knew nothing, your expected utility was 70. If the forecast was bad, your expected utility went down. You end up with 53, which is worse. So you got your information, and now all of a sudden your expected utility is worse. But the thing is, the expression we look at, this difference over here, is not just looking at one outcome. It is true that some evidence could be the unlucky evidence, and you're doing worse. But if that's the particularly unlucky evidence, right, you're still weighting it by the probability of that particular evidence popping up. And so when you sum everything together in the right way, in this case, if very often the evidence will be good, you get 95, and when you work out the math, you'll always end up with a positive number. So even though for a particular measurement, your expected utility could have gone down, on the average, before you get a measurement, you know that on the average, by knowing a new piece of evidence, your expected utility will go up. Yes? This thing over here? What do you mean with misleading? OK, so the question is, can we come up with probabilities sitting in here that make things work out such that this quantity is negative? And you could definitely imagine coming up with things that make this work, right? If you we have here a 53 and a 95, you could say, well, and this is 70. Well, let me just put a 0 0.99 here, a 0 0.01 here. Now it definitely looks like I'm going to end up with a negative number, right? But even though right now that might look to be the case, it actually cannot happen. And the reason it cannot happen is because this 70 here is also computed based on those same probabilities. Those probabilities come into play. Your probabilistic model cannot be different for these two computations. And since you're using the same probabilistic model over these variables, whenever you try to rig it over here, you'll end up coming up with different numbers over here, too. And it'll actually work out. And the intuition of why it'll work out is really this scenario over here. So let's look at this again. What we talked about is you have some MEU over here for plus E, right? the initial evidence. You have some MEU here for plus E and plus E prime. That actually could be better or worse than the first one. Could go either way in terms of expected utility, because you saw some particular evidence. And so with, for a particular piece of evidence, it could always be the unlucky thing, and now you could be worse off. Now, here, what we look at is, what if you don't know the evidence yet, but there's a distribution over possible next evidence, E prime, and you average out what's sitting here is actually this one. If that's the unlucky one, you'll still get compensated here by the lucky one on the other side. Right? And so the reason that in this particular scenario, 
we can never do this one here is always smaller than or equal to this one over here. The cleanest way I think to think of it is that you can draw this tree over here again in a different way. Like think about what would happen if E prime were to also come into this tree. Well, what would happen is your action sequence is still fixed. You get to choose over here at the top. So what that would mean is that somehow that E prime would come into play later, which is exactly what happens here. But you already would be committed to your action. So you would have something where you say maximizer takes action one or action two, let's say. After that, we have a chance node, which makes it plus E prime or negative E prime. Same here, chance node plus E prime, negative E prime. After that chance node, there is another chance node that makes it, that follows the distribution for S given plus, let's write, write this out, probably for S given plus E and plus E prime for that one over there. And then after that, you have the utility node, right? So what's happening here is that you commit to the action on top, and then you have E prime revealed too late to influence your action. And because it comes after you choose your action, you can't use it to help pick the right action. And it's equivalent to saying that here and here you're required to take the same action. And keep in mind, what this thing is computing, maximum expected utility is computing over all possible policies. All possible poli policies. Your policies are, you can do left, left. You can do left, right. You can do right, left. And you can do right, right. So here you're computing the maximum over all four of those options. If you now restrict yourself to just the maximum over these two options, that maximum will be lower. And that's equivalent to solving this problem over here. So we know that that problem will always have a lower expected utility than the one at the bottom because we restricted our options. Yes? Yeah, I'm just, because there are no names for the actions here, I'm just calling them, when the maximizer node splits, there's an arrow going to the left, an arrow going to the right. I'm just going to, calling the action associated with the arrow going to the left, L, and the action associated with the arrow going to the right, I'm call, calling R. Okay, let's take a break here and then look at some more properties of value of information after the break. All right, let's restart. Um, we were looking at properties of value of information, value of perfect information. So let's round up some properties on one slide. What we have just been looking at is that the value of perfect information is bigger than zero. That property we've just been going through extensively. We've also seen, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, that doesn't mean that once you have a particular piece of evidence that your expected utility has increased. Typically, for some evidence, your expected utility will go up. For some other evidence, it will go down. But an expectation, you will have that you can do better. And so that's why this is always true. It's non-additive. It's not the case that if you compute the value of perfect information for one variable and then another variable that you can just sum them up and get the value of perfect information for getting both variables. Why is that? Let's think of a very simple example. Let's say what you really care about is a variable z. And once you know z, you can take the right action and get really high utility. But if you don't know z, then you know, if you're wrong in guessing what z is, you can't do very well. So knowing z is really important to you. Now let's say z is the XOR 
of variables x and y. And x and y have 50-50 chance of being 0, 1. Then by knowing one of x and y, you know nothing about z. Either one of them has value of perfect information of 0. But once you know both x and y, you do know z, because you just compute the xor of x and y, and now you know z. And z is the, va the variable you really wanted to know, and so you now get a lot of value of information from knowing both of them. So it's possible by seeing each one of them separately, your value is 0. But seeing both of them, all of a sudden, you get a high value of perfect information. It can also work the other way around. It could be that you have two sensors, for example. One is very accurate. The other one is only medium accurate. Then it could be, once you get to, and each one of them has some value of perfect information that's strictly positive. But now, once you've measured something with a very accurate sensor, in addition getting to measure the not so accurate sensor, you can imagine that you're not getting a whole lot out of that anymore, maybe even nothing. Similarly, if you first got to measure the inaccurate sensor, that might already take some value away from your accurate sensor, because you now already narrowed it down a little bit. So the most typical case is one where you have a bunch of sensors, and once you've seen one measurement, getting to see the other one will not have as much value as if it had been originally the first one you got to see. But you can just as well design scenarios like the XR case, where they give you nothing until you've seen all of them. All right. Now, this property always holds true, and this is just encoding that it doesn't matter in which order you measure. Whether you first get to measure sensor K and then sensor J, or the other way around, is the same. And so the value of perfect information of getting to know both of them is the same as the value of perfect information of getting to know EJ, followed by the additional value of perfect information of, in addition, getting EK. Or the other way around, you get the value of perfect information of EK. And then what you get in addition, after you already had EK, what do you still get out of EJ? That's This expression over here is the value of perfect information when you already had gotten to see EK. And now, in addition, you get to see EJ. Any questions about these properties? All right, a couple of quick questions then to see if we got this all down. First one, the soup of the day is either clam chowder or split pea. But you would not order either one of them. What's the value of knowing which one is the soup of the day? Zero, right? Because your action would never be affected by it. Hence, your utility would also not be affected by it. And that's it. There are two kinds of plastic forks at a picnic. One kind is slightly sturdier. What's the value of knowing which is the sturdier type of fork? <laughs> Who's going to come up with a number for this? <laughs> OK, people start laughing. It makes sense. That means you understood it. You say, well, really, I need to know how much value there is right, in getting to know, getting to use the sturdier fork. If I eat with my hands, no matter what, it's zero again. But if you do like eating with a fork, and you don't like it when your fork breaks while you're eating, then there is some value of information in knowing which one is the sturdier one. Numerical one here. You're playing the lottery. The prize will be zero or $100. You can play any number between 1 and 100. And the distribution is uniform. So your chance of winning is going to be 1% for each of these numbers. What is the value of knowing the winning number ahead of time? One suggestion is 100. So what we're computing here is the difference between the maximum expected utility when we have no information minus sum over values of that number, maximum expected utility when you do know the number. No, it's the other way around. We're 
doing a plus here and a negative here. So let's see, what do we have for the first one that is, well, everything is the same. You always have an expected utility of, let's see, oh, we have to associate numbers with this here. The price will be 0 or 100. Well, we'll assume that this means that 0 if you lose and 100 if you win, right? It wasn't very explicit, but 0 for the losing numbers, 100 for the winning numbers. So this would be, well, you would have minus 1, because your expected utility with no knowledge would be 1. Here you have whatever the outcome is, whatever they tell you, this is going to be the outcome, you're going to, your best action is to pick that number, and you're going to win 100. So this comes down to sum really from n equals 1 to 100, 1 over 100 times 100, because that would be, your best action would result in 100. This is minus 1 plus 100 which is 99. All right. What is the value of imperfect information? One suggestion is zero. Other suggestions? Well, in what we're going to be working with, we're going to claim there is not su no such thing as imperfect information. Our information is always going to be perfect. So, no such thing. And now you might say, well, intuitively, what if I just have this sensory reading of the variable I really care about? Well, then, what we can look at is the value of perfect information of that sensory reading. So the way we model things is, whatever it is that we think is a noisy version of something else, that means we have an additional variable in the base net that is a child of the original variable that we cared about, and that child is then a noisy version of the original variable. And we can then compute the value of perfect information of that child variable. All right, here's another one. We can now go back to the oil drilling example. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let you into a little secret that's a connection between deseparation and value of perfect information. You've taken the exam. Um, you've, if you looked at past final exams, you know that we love asking questions where we look at more than one concept in one question. So here's an example of one of those things. So we'll look at this particular setup now. There's an oil location. There could be a scouting report about where the oil location is. That's a noisy ver version of the oil location. And then there's a scout. And that scout could be a reliable or a unreliable scout. Presumably, high probability on the reliable scout, but you know, every now and then, the scout that ends up being sent out is an unreliable one. Let's ask some questions here. Value of perfect information, this is what we'll ask you. We'll say like, okay, is this strictly bigger than zero or not, right? Value of perfect information of oil location. We've looked at that before, right? It helps us to know that it was k over two, that's bigger than zero. Value of perfect information of the scouting report. Assuming it gives us some information, right, about the oil location, that's going to be strictly bigger than zero. Because it'll help us to decide where to drill. Of course, this does depend on the conditional probability tables. You could pick very weird conditional probability tables where the scouting report is, in effect, independent of the oil location, and then, of course, you have zero. Let's assume it's a, usually, eh, with a good scout, you get a good um, reading of the oil location. What is the value of perfect information of knowing whether it's a good or a bad scout? I hear a zero somewhere. Anybody else? Zero is one option. Say that again. Greater than zero is another option. Those are kind of the two options we have. <laughs> we got it covered. Um, I'm going to claim zero. And I'm going to claim that I don't even have to do any computation in this base net to compute this. By default, we'd have to compute something of the form PPI. So this would be equal to maximum expected utility for the case where we get 
scout minus MEU for no information. When we compute the expected utility, what matters is the probability distribution for the parent variables of the utility node. Observing scout doesn't change the distribution of the parent nodes of the utility node. Why? We have D separation between scout and oil location. So we know, even without looking at the conditional probability tables, that we're guaranteed that whatever reading we get for scout, good or bad scout, is not going to affect our distribution for the parents of the utility node, which means it's not going to affect our expected utility. And so we know that this is going to be equal to zero. We get no information by getting to know the scout type about oil location. How about scout given scouting report? Who says bigger than zero? Raise, raise your uh, hands. Bigger than zero. Who says zero? So a couple of zeros, but more bigger than zeros. I'm going to claim typically this is going to be strictly bigger than zero. Why? By knowing what type of scout we have, it'll tell us whether we can trust the scouting report or not, which in turn will tell us something about the oil location. And so by getting that additional information about the type of scout, we're able to better choose our action. It affected our distribution for the parents of the utility node. And so we get a expected utility, maximum expected utility that's better by knowing the scout. So this one is, we have bigger than zero, bigger than zero, equal to zero, bigger than zero. The general rule is that if it's true that the parents of u are conditionally independent of z, which is your variable you're considering to compute the value of perfect information for, given the current evidence, then the value of perfect information of z given that current evidence is equal to zero. We might give you numbers. We might give you a big base net in which it takes you a long time to compute following the definition what the value of perfect information is of some variable. And some of you could be, well, presumably not the ones of you who are in lecture right now or the ones of you who are watching this video, but the ones of you who are not hearing this story could be the ones that are very busy computing numerically this value of perfect information and then saying, wow, this exam was just too long for the time we were given. Whereas others would be like, wow, that was a short exam. Lots of quick answers because I was just using this shortcut method to already know that some VPIs are zero. Question there. Which one are you asking about of these four? Three is not useful because scout is conditionally independent of oil location. And oil location is the only parent variable of u. In four, scout is useful because once you observe the scouting report, it's not true anymore that scout is conditionally independent of oil location. OK, what we really have here now, with this entire framework in place, is something called a POMDP. Remember MDPs, state, action, state, and so forth, really encoding expect to max trees? You can do the same thing where we now, the chance, the chance nodes are now not just influenced by our state we land, state and action, but also by an observation. We get a sensory reading which is a random sensory reading, which follows some distribution, and we have a split on that. That's what we've been seeing in our expected max trees today. And if you say, oh, expected max led us to MDPs, you can say the same thing about the expected max trees that we have seen today with evidence variables, evidence variables built in. The corresponding MDP is called a POMDP, where PO stands for partially observable, meaning that you don't actually get to see the state, you get to see some other random variables in your base net, rather than the ones that determine the state that in turn determines uh, the utility values. We're not going to get into a whole lot of details about POMDPs right now, but here's a Ghostbusters example. In principle, working with these POMDPs, you could start making decisions about whether you want to bust or sense. 
So the simplest way to think of them is you have some evidence set. That's how we've looked at them so far. You take an action. You have evidence set in action. Then some new evidence will come up randomly. You get a new maximizer node. You again get to choose an action, and this keeps repeating. Instead of annotating them with evidence sets, you could annotate with the probability distribution over state given the evidence. Or here, B prime, probability distribution for state given E and in this case it's called O, so the second observation O. Might as well call it E prime. Let's call this E prime. So it's just a new way of writing this. Instead of writing E and E prime is known here, you say we have a new distribution as a consequence for the state, and we call that B. Just a new letter we introduce as a shorthand for P, S, given E and E prime. What you now can do, if you work with this kind of setup, you start have the computer play Ghostbusters for you. And this is what you're going to do in your project four. Um, in a slightly more complicated setting. But you get to choose an action, either bust or sense, based on your current evidence, E. If you bust, game is over, you get some utility. If you sense, you get a new observation, which is a stochastic transition. And from there, you now have a new set of evidence, E and E prime, and you again get to pick a bust or sense action. So let's look at this in action. Let's go back to Ghostbusters. Let's exit this version of Ghostbusters. And let's look at the computer play for us. The computer will solve this tree over here. It will solve this expect the max tree, and based on that, automatically decide whether to bust, then well to sense, looking two steps ahead. We have computer playing. Here's our initial situation. Again, 2% everywhere. Time plus 1. Computer will sense somewhere. Initially, it's not a very intelligent decision. It's, you know, pretty much anywhere will work. At this point, the computer has a distribution. For, it can compute the expected utility of busting for any of those locations. It can compute the what would happen if I sense somewhere, many possible outcomes. And then at the next time, would decide to bust. That's what it's doing. It's just looking one step of sensing, one step of busting ahead. You can imagine doing this much deeper and thinking about what if I were to sense and then sense again, sense again, a much deeper search. It's just looking two steps deep. That's it. Based on that, it decides that it has to sense again, and it's sensed in the top left corner. Again, it's going to solve this expected max tree up to depth two, decide where it should sense next. I mean, you could try to think about it and see if you can predict what the computer would do. So it's again solving and sensing there. Solving, sensing there. Solving at depth to expect max, sensing down there. It'll know what to do. It has a utility for successfully busting. It has a utility that's negative for sensing. So doing a lot of sensing gives you negative utility before you finally get your positive one. So there's a trade-off there. You might not want to sense for too long. Let's see what happens. Computed hit. It was lucky. It busted the ghost successfully and won the game. What you saw here in action is a prelude to what you are going to do. Something like you're going to do something like this in your projects four. The difference being that what we haven't covered yet, and we'll cover in next lecture, is that the ghost can be moving around while you're tracking them down. All right, happy spring break, everyone. See you in a little over a week.